Can you guys hear me? My mic doesn't seem hot. Is mic hot? Yeah. Now it's hot? No? Yeah. Hot or not? All right. Um, thank you for coming this afternoon. I am going to give a very different talk. It is the management track, and this is going to do two things. One of them is I really want to make you more successful and more potent. We have a lot of latent talent and technical skill and supply uh, in the OWASP community. What we don't have is a lot of executive demand. Right? Everything's supply and demand. And we get really frustrated because we say, well, nothing's going to change until we have software liability, or nothing's going to change until executives care, or nothing's going to change until they're breached. Um, and I'm just too stubborn to accept that. Um, there's this great George Bernard Shaw quote, which says, uh, it's about the unreasonable man. It said, the reasonable man expects the, uh, excuse me, what is it? The reasonable man conforms himself to the world. The unreasonable man expects the world to conform to him. And that is why all progress and change depends on the unreasonable man. So I want to teach you guys to be a little more stubborn. And uh, I was actually asked to come by some of the organizers because of this talk that I gave with my, my colleague, David Etchu. So if you're wondering where he is, uh, he could not come uh, for family reasons and was never intending to. But I want to give him ample credit because this is the, essentially the culmination of a three-year collaboration between us where we basically just don't want to accept that ineffective security uh, reigns. So this wasn't specifically about application security, but I think what you're going to find is because my heart spent in application security, it's one of the reasons I was a founder of Rugged Software, um, and now the I am the Cavalry movement, which I will pivot to next. Um, I really care about new triggers and new catalysts to improve the way we engage with the business and do security. So sometimes I talk about Rugged Software, sometimes about Rugged DevOps with um, Gene Kim and I have been kind of like leading the the way I'm bridging the DevOps community to things like availability, sustainability, survivability, things that they want and care about. I also like to talk about zombies. I researched Anonymous for a couple of years at Great Personal Peril. And recently, I started the I Am the Cavalry movement about one year ago. And this is the idea. The informal mission is essentially saving lives through security research. But what we did is we said the cavalry isn't coming, and it falls to security professionals to be a voice of reason and technical literacy and educate industries and government um, policymakers on issues that affect public safety and human life. And as such, we've been driving security concepts into automotive security, uh, medical device security, critical infrastructure, public infrastructure, and um, home IoT, or the Internet of Things. So um, I'm, I'm passionate about these things, not just because I want to be better to solve a, pos a puzzle, but because our dependence on IT and software is growing much faster than our ability to secure it. And we can't keep having the same failure rates that we've been experiencing. And since software is eating the world, I actually say software is infecting the world. If you were sitting on the moon and watching, it would look just like the bubonic plague, right? Software is making its way in all sorts of things. And that's why we can't get incrementally better. We have to get significantly better. And that's going to take fresh approaches. So this talk was really part three of a three-year trilogy, which kind of tied together many of the things. And a lot of these actually make it into the, the the grad school course I teach for Carnegie Mellon. It's really trying to like rethink the way that we approach security strategically to have the most impact. Uh, I love zombies, by the way. Yeah. So um, the quote is essentially from the Dylan Thomas poem, which is where Bob Dylan stole his name. His actual name is uh, Robert Zimmerman. Um, and essentially, this is not the story of a single CISO, but an aggregate CISO, because one of the things that David Etchew and I have in common is we really go to high-risk um, actual organizations, and we work deeply with them to solve really hard problems. So these aren't just like theoretical, throw an idea at the wall. These are based in grounded studies, and we will point out a few specific case studies uh, towards the end. Um, but essentially, one of the things we noticed, in fact, some of you know that I actually was part of the, a different touchy-feely research project called InfoSec Burnout. We actually did a psychological stress analysis called the Maslock Stress Index, because we disproportionately have substance abuse problems, suicides, depression. Um, we have one of the highest burnout rates of any profession. And now we have data to show it. So this Maslach Stress Index is usually applied to doctors, ER surgeons, soldiers, and whatnot. Uh, and it measures three things. Um, number one, it's a, it's a survey, but it measures um, your fatigue. So how tired are you? Um, based on a whole bunch of questions to determine that. It measures your um, cynicism. And it measures your, this one's a mouthful, perceived self-efficacy. So how well do you feel that you're doing at your job? Not how well are you doing, but how well do you feel you're doing? And if you're in the red zone on any one of them, in other professions, they'll usually give you paid time off or some counseling or maybe some career coaching. 
Um, we are in the red zone on fatigue. We love our 40-hour work weeks so much that we do two of them <laughs> by Wednesday. Um, that's Jack Daniel's joke. Uh, number two, um, cynicism is our core competence, apparently, because we had the highest score of any profession for cynicism. Perhaps that comes as a surprise. I don't think so. Uh, and then we were on the border on uh, the efficacy one. A lot of us thought we were doing a good job, and a lot of us thought we were doing a miserable job. There was nothing in between. It was actually a double hump. And my belief on that is that belief that because you pass the audit, you're doing good, and then when you get breached, you realize what a false sense of security that was. But the bottom line is, it's a very overwhelming and stressful job, and you should feel some permission to feel that way. It's not that we don't, it's not that we have it worse than others. These are still, you know, first world problems. It's more a matter that these other professions have it clearly diagnosed it, and they take steps to manage it, and we don't. So we manage it other ways, like with bourbon, as may have been discussed earlier. <laughs> <coughs> so uh, when I was an analyst for the 451 group, I, I drew this on the whiteboard one time. I used to do these CISO roundtables with David, uh, where we'd have like 200 CISOs for two days, and we'd tackle tough problems. And basically, I said, where's this stress coming from? And it's that the cost and complexity of doing security was ballooning. And it's because we were beset on all sides by constant and turbulent change. And these were the real five triggers. Essentially, there's evolving threats. That's why I got into security. I wanted to fight bad guys. So when there's new threats like anonymous or nation states or whatever, that impacts your ability to do your job. And they're constantly changing. There's also evolving compliance. And around 2003, compliance eclipsed threat management as the number one driver of security spend to the point where it was 50-50 spend, then it was 100% spend. If it wasn't on the PCI digital dozen, you couldn't get a penny for it. Uh, and now it, we're getting a little bit better, but not much. It's still heavily dominated by compliance mandatory spending. Evolving technologies at the time meant x86 virtualization or cloud computing. It might be bringing your own device or mobility. Now it's the Internet of Things or embedded. So pick your favorite disruption. Software-defined networking is a huge game changer. DevOps is a huge game changer. Economics was really feast and famine in the budget cycles or in how you could consume things or what the socioeconomic climate looked like. And then the evolving business needs is what does your market or your CEO or your board of directors command of the business. And pretty much a trigger on any one of these can give you a hard time. But what isn't ballooning is your budget and your staff and your, you know, your ability to execute. So essentially what we tried to do is we found most programs are really, really good at one of these and they are maybe good at two. And what we were encouraging them is anytime you see a trigger on one of these tendrils, marshal yourself through what are the other downstream impacts. So for example, in the wake of Hurricane Katrina, uh, every business was looking at their disaster recovery business continuities. So that was a business driver. And as such, they said to the CFO, there's no way we're building a second entire brick and mortar data center, so screw that. And then they looked to a nascent x86 virtualization technology that wasn't ready yet, or some sort of cloud computing at the time. And they adopted it before they could understand it. And as such, none of their security controls worked. And the compliance auditors didn't know if they could pass you. And the adversaries were like, this is awesome. Not only do we have all the old ways to, to own them, we have new ways to own them. They can't even run antivirus in a VM. So these trigger changes, and that's one of the reasons you're so burned out. I am speaking quickly on purpose, partly because I know you're smart and partly because there's a lot of stuff to go through. But if anybody wants me to slow down, just let me know. Um, but one of the things that really gripped me early on, and this was just a simple idea, was you know, we also spend too much time on the wrong stuff. Um, if you think about where the lion's share of our time and energy goes, it's on highly replaceable credit cards. You know, we've, I think a third of Americans lost a credit card in the target breach alone. Uh, there really weren't many victims. It was a mild inconvenience, right? It, it hurt somebody somewhere down the line, but it, we spent an awful lot of time on a high frequency, low impact, kind of event like that. Whereas we were spending a whole lot less time, almost no time, on intellectual property, trade secrets, less replaceable assets. And one of the reasons I've gravitated towards the I Am the Cavalry initiative is there's irreplaceable things like human life and public safety. There's $80 billion annually spent on uh, hardware, software, and services for security products. And almost none of that goes into insulin pumps or cars or anything like that. Basically zero. Statistically zero money goes into that. Now, I don't think we should make antivirus and a 9-volt battery-powered IPS for your insulin pump, but I do think um, some of our best and brightest should probably be shifting towards secure, defensible IT architecture and software design. All right, so um, a lot of us in the wake of these things kind of want to give up, but I'm like saying, screw that. 
we, we just have to be smarter, right? I mean, no one makes changes until the pain of maintaining inertia exceeds the pain of making change, right? You have to hit rock bottom. You have to be sick and tired of being sick and tired. And then maybe you'll try new things. And what we found is it wasn't technical gaps that we had. It was really understanding the human layer. What motivates people? So um, we're not going to surrender. Um, this is what we're going to do instead. Now, this is um, hopefully legible. The contrast isn't so good. But let me orient you to this, because this is one of the money shots. This is, this is uh, a centerpiece in the Carnegie Mellon course. And it's actually kind of controversial in risk management circles. Um, a lot of risk management circles say it doesn't matter who's attacking you. If you simply harden every device, um, you know, it does, you know, you'll stop anonymous or the Russians or the Chinese. I think that's kind of cute. Uh, I don't know any, anybody who has infinite budget to protect every asset from every adversary. And we talk about risk-based and you know, um, aligning the business. But I, I argue to you, and I'll say this twice if I have to, um, the key determining factor in most of those breaches was nothing you did. None of your defensive choices, none of your security investments. It was who was after you. It was the presence of a predator. It had nothing to do with your PCI compliance. They laugh at your PCI compliance. And I'm going to show that very clearly in a moment. But essentially, um, I like to map a who. Not, so not only do the most risk management programs ignore the adversary, we make it central. And this is something that I've done with CIOs, CSOs, CISOs, CFOs, general counsels. You can do this on a single uh, placemat at a Thai food restaurant. I know because I did that for a Fortune 50 company. And you can significantly change the focus and priorities of the whole, the whole program. So what we did is we said, OK, you have one through N adversaries, the who. Uh, it's a who to a why to a what to a how. So not every company faces every adversary class. So if you know which adversaries or predators you face, each one of them play the game differently. They have different motivational structures. Each one of them, therefore, within that motivation goes after a different preferred prey. They have different assets they prefer. And they don't all have every technique. So what are the techniques or the, the TTPs, the tactics, techniques, and procedures that they use? In fact, the US intelligence community now uses this as well to spot false flags. So it's both um, useful on the strategic investment of where should we place our limited resources to be appropriately balanced with our threat contacts. So that's a proactive tabletop exercise you can do once a year with your executive stakeholder. Or in an instant response, when I was at Akamai as director of security intelligence, I was able to spot false flags pretty routinely when it looked like it was anonymous dossing the bank, but it was really a, a decoy by the Russian business network to buy time for money mules to perpetrate fraud. And you could tell pretty quickly based on the TTPs used. So it was really invaluable to incident responders to tell. And you don't have to have a sophisticated big data model. This was simply, is this technique they're using, or the signature and PCAPs, indicative of common tools used by anonymous? Or are they outside the range used by anonymous? Is this uh, clear, at least at the 50,000 foot level? So for example, if your primary adversary was a hacktivist, then you don't have to, th the idea that I don't have to run faster than the bear, just faster than my buddy, it does not work at all. Most of your conventional wisdom for the faster than the bear idea is based on the idea of a casual adversary who, if you're a harder target, will move to a softer target. But with the case of the Chinese espionage against, R against RSA, the RSA secure ID breach, most people don't know RSA was not the target. Lockheed Martin was a target. And when they couldn't get in, they were so tenacious and target sticky, they went upstream to the supply chain, owned RSA, and then went back to the Lockheed Martin. So the idea of being faster than the bear, no, you poke that bear in the eye, and he's mad at you. The same thing with Anonymous. It was more ideological. And therefore, your game or your supposition of just being slightly faster than your buddy doesn't work anymore. Um, but more, moreover, they didn't target every asset. So when the Sony punishment campaigns happened, do you remember when Sony got punished for like 21 successive uh, attacks? How many of those were done by Anonymous? Everybody thinks 21. It was six. Only six of those attacks were done by Anonymous. The one that, and one of the reasons we knew this instantaneously is they stole 77 million credit cards. And there had not ever been an anonymous attack that stole credit cards prior to that. So basically, that model instantaneously said, I think you're going to want to take a closer look. And it um, turned out it was uh, not anonymous. Um, but these become useful. And one of the reasons you could tell is they only really had three major techniques. They could do denial of service through using the low orbit ion cannon, or they could use uh, phishing rudimentary phishing techniques for executives or the UC equal injection. 
So if you want to have a, a really well balanced, well targeted defense regime against, if that's a likely adversary for you, if you're promoting the, the, C, the CISA or CISPA bill, or if you're the Motion Picture Association, you better have some DDoS prevention because you're likely to need it, right? Whereas if you're never going to provoke them, maybe you don't need it at all. So it's about being more targeted in your investment response. Um, and notice, I don't know if you saw this, but the auditor is an adversary. It's not a joke. Uh, a CIO once told me, he said, Josh, I might get hacked, but I will be fine. So it's an adversary they know is coming, they know when they're coming, and they know exactly what they're going to do. So that's why we prepare for it, right? All right, so I'm going to show some baseball cards. Um, we made baseball cards. We actually want to make a, a card game, much like the cornucopia one. We just have to work out a couple kinks and stop being so darn busy. But essentially, it's the same flow, right? So the upper corner is going to be the strength relative to others. So this is a five. And then it's going to be the who to the why to the what to the how. So a script kitty is motivated by profit and prestige. They go after fungible assets like credit card numbers. And they, their dynamic range of capabilities is essentially metasploit. And if you've heard my term HD Moore's Law, it's the strength of a casual adversary grows at the rate of metasploit. So if you understand that, then you know that um, good enough security yesterday isn't good enough tomorrow because metasploit's constantly getting better. And it's not a knock on Metasploit. You could use Poison Ivy or other tools. But once it becomes weaponized like a fire sheep, right? You all knew how to do what fire sheep did if you're in the OWASP community. Fire sheep made it pointy, clicky, easy. So once it becomes weaponized, uh, it's in the hands of these. And I basically say, if you can't stop Metasploit, you can't stop anyone. So this is, you must be this tall to ride the internet. And my real, even though I'd fought the PCI Council for about four years prior to the HD Moore's Law, that was like the knife through the heart, because what you could basically show is you could pass your audit today and then run Metasploit against your fully compliant network, and it wouldn't, it wouldn't catch Metasploit. So that's proof that it's not a, that's a, it's a dangerous distraction from your actual risk management. I know people love it because it got you budgets for things, but it got us budget to a certain point, and that certain point's too low a bar to actually even stop script kitties. A little faster, the RBN, the Rock Band Network, I mean the Russian Business Network, that one is organized crime. It's profit motive just like script kitties, but they don't even go after credit cards anymore. It's worthless. It's under a dollar per credit card now. So they might do a tactical batch every once in a while for money laundering, et cetera. But they're after account takeovers, ACH check, ACH check fraud, stuff like that, um, because it's, it's just not worth it to them anymore. And they have much better R&D. Everyone says how sophisticated the Russian, I mean, the, 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 uh, the Chinese are, or the APT. Russians are 10 times better than than the Chinese. So they're a really strong threat. I made them 50 out of 50. Uh, speaking of uh, advanced persistent threat, a term I hate, I call them adaptive persistent adversaries because they're, they're more goal oriented, they're more focused. Those are the attributes I use to describe them. There's a white paper on that. But they're after they have a military, industrial, or economic incentive structure. They're after intellectual property trade secrets or national security secrets. And they um, use custom stealthy malware, rootkits, stuff like that. It's very different TTPs. In fact, if you follow the Mania APT1 report, or you participate in NetWitness or Mania information sharing communities or indicators of compromise, they use those to fingerprint TTPs so you can tell in general who's attacking you. Not hard attribution, but soft attribution, or at least actionable category of attribution. Um, I studied uh, chaotic actors. Um, for quite some time, wrote a, a year and a half long blog series with Jericho, who's at the Tenable booth. Uh, attrition.org, um, and very different motivational structure. They're either in it for fun, like uh, LulzSec, or they're in it for some moral cause. Um, Anti-surveillance, anti-censorship, uh, anti-corporate, um, but motivation is very, very different. Very tenacious and very determined. And they pretty much went after web properties, individuals, governments, whatnot, and, but much, much more limited. Aside from Jeremy Hammond, who was a fantastic hacker, um, very little hacking talent, so it was mostly predictable tools. Then there's the zombie auditors who suck our will to live. Um, and uh, they are also motivated, right? They have profit and compliance. The cottage industry of being a QSA or QIRA, unbelievably profitable, right? There's entire companies, the entire portfolio are based around the PCI data security standard. Uh, but their target asset is only this co the card data environment, the CDE, right? It's, it's only what's in scope, which is one of the reasons it's also distracting because you can become compliant on your card data environment and spend zero pennies on your corporate secrets, intellectual property, R&D. In fact, a Fortune 50 company was spending zero on anything but card data. And that's why I had to use that lunch discussion over Thai food. And their weapon of choice is the, is the checklist. Right? 
All right, uh, so I already hinted at Moore's Law, but I, if you talk about the change in attacker power, I said compute power doubles every 18 months uh, to 24, depending on who you ask. And HD Moore's Law is that the strength of a script kitty or a casual adversary grows at the rate of available hacker tools. So you could give up in the face of this different adversary stuff, or you could be much, much smarter. Like, let's not just do some generic one-size-fits-all checklist of how to manage risk. You could look at PCI as a wonderful way to fend off QSAs. Um, not so good against others, and we'll show that in a minute. So when we tried to ask, how do you do this, of course I had to turn to zombies. I'll be very quick about my zombies here. I have a much longer zombie talk. Um, if you're being chased by hordes of the undead, uh, would you run to that wooden barn that's falling apart with holes in the wall, or would you run to something more defensible? Right? So this pyramid I'm going to outline is, is also really pivotal to the Carnegie Mellon stuff. It's, and I believe it's just immutable truth. We can debate it in the hallway if you like, but essentially I use this to say if you, if you want to have a relative investment, if you're going to spend a dollar or a person on security, a dollar spent at the top of the pyramid is an empty calorie. A dollar spent at the bottom is much, much more value relative to the other options. And it's essentially um, the multiples applied to your effort. So I'm, I'm arguing for we want to do the stuff at the bottom first, or at least with a heavier investment, and the stuff at the top um, fills in the gaps. So if you want defensible infrastructure, this is the idea that you are preordained to success or failure based on the choices your CIO and your CTO make. So as they procure this rack space versus coal fire versus whatever, as they're procuring uh, an, an iPhone with a mandatory access control architecture is more inherently defensible than an Android with a discretionary access control architecture. Something with a million lines of code is inherently less defensible than something with a thousand lines of code. It does, it's not so much getting into implementation, it's saying there are ways to qualitatively and quantitatively determine the relative defensibility of IT choice A versus B versus C, and one of the best gains you can make is to influence more defensible choices. Is it a wooden barn or is it a brick building? I don't care how good your fighting force of zombie killers are, they're going to be dead if they're in an indefensible architecture. So that's the most important thing, and that's why myself and a few others really push for the rugged software manifesto and the idea of choosing and building and designing and implementing more defensible software and digital infrastructure. The second most, thing, most important thing isn't security either. It's uh, operational excellence. So this, in the zombie metaphor, do your fellow survivors keep their wits about them? stay calm, act as a unit, or are they panicking and screaming and running cross-purpose to each other? And the real exemplar here is Gene Kim's original book called Visible Ops. They studied all the high-performing IT operations, and they found that of the 115 or so patterns that they captured, three of them had the most impact. And those three were, do you know what you have? Do you know when it changes? And do you have a zero-tolerance policy for unplanned changes? Again, that's not security at all. That's do you have a change management process? And they found the best CIOs were former military enlisted officers or um, biochemists or auditors. Those were the three top professions that made the best CIOs. And all of them had in common discipline. So you want to have defensible infrastructure that reduces your attack surface, but you also want operational excellence, which reduces your chaos and entropy. Right? Defensible infrastructure that's well run. The third most important thing, now the industry is starting to figure this out, starts to get into security. And this is the idea that we're fighting in the dark, and we're fighting blindly, we die quickly. So we have insufficient lighting and instrumentation and visibility. So if you don't have the flood lamps to know how many zombies are attacking, from which direction, and are they zombies or werewolves or vampires, because as we know from our folklore uh, and horror movies, they require different countermeasures, right? Silver bullets and wooden stakes and whatnot. So you want defensible infrastructure that's well uh, maintained and well instrumented. So you can see who's coming from which direction. These are eyes and ears to notice whispers and echoes. This is the stuff where you see NetWitness and Solera and Nixon or Anomaly and NetFlow, behavioral anomaly detection. The idea that you can do anomaly detection, by the way, is predicated on knowing what normal is. So if you have a chaotic, unmanaged, undisciplined environment, good luck getting any value out of anomaly detection. So I see this as a prerequisite to things like NetFlow analysis and whatnot. And also, if you're a government person, this idea of information sharing and the, the pending laws about can we get information sharing in the industry, that's not going to keep you from getting eaten from zombies. It's saying, I'm being eaten by this zombie this way. How are you being eaten by that zombie over there when no one's actually trying to get to defensible shelter? So it's not zero value. It's just less value than avoiding the zombie you know, smorgasbord. 
And then come the brittle countermeasures. These are the empty calories. These are the things that uh, if we have a foo threat, we make an anti-foo. Virus, antivirus, you know, worms, IDS, IPS. You know, those don't work, we make next gen of everything, right? So we just keep throwing more security at it, and that's why we have $80 billion to spend on brittle, avoidable countermeasures. You still need the weapons, but you need the right tool for the job. So once again, defensible infrastructure, well run, well instrumented, and then you can use in sparing methods the proper countermeasures for your actual defensible environment. Is that clear as mud? There's a longer version if you like it. All right, it will come up again. So, but if you're going to make some changes, one of the things that defeats us and makes us depressed is um, we look at the things we can control. You know the serenity prayer? You know, give me the, uh, what is it, the, the strength to change the things I can, the uh, patience to accept the things I cannot, and uh, the wisdom to know the difference. So we actually had made a cloud serenity prayer. But what we forget when we talk about this binary thing of can I or can't I control it, we have very little control. But what we forget is we have a lot of influence. And there's things that you can influence, and there's things that you can't even influence. But we, we really forget this middle ground, and we're going to drive home actual, very potent, unlikely allies and methods in the next section of this that can help you win, right? So unlock your inner rage and become the superhero that you know you can be. Um, rage against the dying and the light from the poem. This is one of the ugliest slides I've ever made, and I keep it ugly on purpose because it should be ugly. Um, you won't even be able to read it. But let me just orient you to this. What we basically thought about is how do actual security things get through the system? You have desires that you want to do. You have uh, things that get in the way, the big brick walls. And then you have outcomes, right? And when we tried to map quantitatively, we just did heat maps of every CISO. We said, how do you get budgets approved? How does it work? And essentially, there's these swim lanes. So you can't just buy what you want. You have to have a business justification, an ROI, and regulatory compliance mandate. So these things that you can't read, these are you know, controls. Antivirus, firewall, IPS, WAF, the ones up top, right? And then it goes all the way down. And as an analyst, um, the reason I made them so small to read is when I was an analyst uh, at the 451 group, I was tracking 140 distinct categories. I believe Gartner's up to 180 now. That should, that's just disgusting. And, and by the way, we've never retired a single one of them. There's, n there, there's nothing in the, uh, the stack that we've retired. We shift the spending, but we still have all of them. So these are things like antivirus and whatnot. And essentially, compliance like PCI, the reason we use it is it works. It's a pretty wide swim lane. The problem is it's very specific. You can get the 11 controls. I call them PCI's chosen few. There's 11 required. And you can get them through. Here's the misnomer, though. You're not protecting your whole organization. You tend to be protecting the card data environment. One of my CISOs was uh, so clever because he couldn't get any budget. He deliberately, the right thing to do with your card data environment is to consolidate it. He deliberately put card data everywhere so you could buy new IPS devices to at least try to get in the R&D networks. And he was having this constant fight with the compliance officer because she's like, we're supposed to be consolidating. He's like, don't tell anybody. It was a great trick because that's how he actually cross-pollinated and got a few basic controls in other places. So compliance tends to be a driver and you can get that stuff in. Um, the next one tends to be um, productivity. Is this working? All right. All right, it's not working. So productivity tends to work as well. Nobody buys anti-spam as a security product. They buy it as a productivity enabler, because you would never get any email read if you didn't have it. Another one would be single sign-on, right? It's usually bought by the IT help desk, because the, the cost of resets is just too high. So they do things like password stuff, password management stuff, single sign-on. There's the, the dreaded ROI, which a lot of us don't think exists. Um, having a hard return on investment that actually drives, drives a profit for your company is almost unheard of. But some people have done a pretty decent thing. And there's the quarterback sneak, which is when, a, when you have a breach or someone in your industry has a breach, if you have a ready-made um, business case to buy the thing that you already wanted to buy, you can say, you know, we really should do this project, boss. I don't, I'm not a big fan of that one, but people do it. Perhaps you've done it. Is anybody else use other tricks than this before I go on? These are pretty much the common ones. Yeah. So, uh, but you're special. All right, well, go ahead.
Okay. So you insert it into IT projects. It's good. Uh, another one that people point out that I didn't include was if you're in the federal government, you have to spend your money or lose it at the end of a cycle. So they can get a lot of stuff through just on the ebb and flow of uh, budget cycles. So these new ones I added, these are things that are less obvious, but when people, the, the CISOs that we saw that really understood how to use their influence, they added these, and they tended to be really nice. So for example, DevOps, which we have an entire track tomorrow with amazing DevOps speakers, and I really, this is essentially the, the precursor trailer to DevOps, because DevOps is a massive game changer. But essentially, DevOps can get you a whole bunch of sur survivability, sustainability, availability type um, benefits from either the stuff that you buy or the stuff that you build. Um, we're we're going to park that one for a minute. Honest risk assessment, if you actually have a quantitative risk management team like an Alex Hutton type or a Dave Mortman type, who's one of our speakers tomorrow, um, you can actually make a good risk decision saying, look, we have this adversary, we have a gap here on these assets against these techniques. It works, but it's hard to be a good risk management person, but it's very effective. One of the best ones is general counsel, and this is actually what I helped an insurance company do. Um, a lot of people believe that if someone steals your intellectual property, you can just sue them. Uh, that's not true. Um, and if you fact, we brought the general counsel to lunch, and I said, what happens if you try to sue somebody for stealing stuff uh, and you didn't do anything to protect it? He goes, well, actually, you have to demonstrate that you took reasonable steps to keep your secret secret or you'll lose. So there's just a lot of belief that you, know, you can just let that go. So the general counsel actually got funding for things like net witness and data loss prevention and disk encryption. Uh, they couldn't get a budget for it, but the general counsel became an advocate for that. They won't give you an advocate for everything, but they can advocate for things like uh, trade secrets, intellectual property, research data. Um, a lot of people use that now. It's becoming a growing trick. Procurement's a freaking awesome one. I'm going to show you that in a minute. And then disruption. So I don't want to spend too much time on this uh, because I'm going to show you a much better way to, to approach this. So general counsel can get intellectual property protection, PHI, healthcare. Procurement, anything you buy, you can uh, shove in um, terms and conditions. In fact, the rugged handbook and the rugged implementation guide on our website actually give um, sample of procurement guidelines and call for uh, request for proposal and terms and conditions language that we've seen people use. <coughs> and then for the researchers in the room that really want to change the industry at the macro level, and this is when I wrote this, I hadn't yet started the cavalry, but we don't use trial lawyers very well. We don't use legislation. I've been uh, I've had I've personally done 80 congressional briefings this year alone, trying to educate and influence. Uh, U.S. Congress people. Um, open source uh, projects are a great ch place to inject um, advances or quality, things like that, hearts and minds, public media, blah, blah, blah. So the biggest question, though, because we hated the swim lanes, that was last year's talk. We hated how ugly it was. Let's just talk about the teammates themselves. We, we showed you an adversary mapping. Let's map our teammates, right? So you can either fight this alone, which most of us do, and that's why we're so defeated. And this is one of the reasons I freaking love DevOps, is they've learned that you can't do it alone. You have to combine talents and, and skills. Or you can do it as a team. So be that raging guy who's saying, I'm not going to accept defeat. And you have a bunch of executive superheroes that could be on this. It's not so much that you need to be a hero, because when trying to be a hero, we, you know, you're defeated pretty often. We don't want you to be a hero. We want you to assemble the Avengers, right? Um, assemble a, a, a comprehensive program out of small pieces of advocacy from the right motivated uh, um, assets, the CIO, CFO, blah, blah, blah. So guess what? We're going to give you some baseball cards for them. The supporting cast as well, they may not be executives, but they're very powerful sidekicks. So general counsel. Remember the motivational structure? Up in the upper corner is how strong they are. But because these are defenders, I also put a little you know, thumbnail indicator of where in the pyramid they help you. Clearly, the stuff at the bottom is more important than the stuff at the top. And then I'll tell you their motivational structure, so who they are, how they're motivated, what their uh, preferred assets are that they like to defend, and their tactics, techniques, and procedures to secure that. So your general counsel is all about due care and fiduciary responsibility. Right? That's all they really care about. They went to school for this. They practice this. That's what they do. The assets that they care about defending are your intellectual property trade secrets and sensitive organizational information that would be material disclosure or breach if you're publicly traded. You'd have to file material disclosures. So anything that falls in that category, they could be your best friend. And what they use is policy, internal policy. Thank you. They use contracts for your supply chain and your suppliers. And they use attorney-client privilege, which, by the way, is really awesome. Um, attorney-client privilege is really, really awesome when you're in legal areas that you don't want to discuss. So um, they can often be helpful there. 
And I think they're a pretty strong ally. I put them right in the middle of the pack at 25 uh, strength defense. They really don't help you on procurement of defensible infrastructure, nor do they help you on IT operations, but they can help you get instrumentation to, for things like data loss prevention, um, network forensics, and the like. They love NetWitness because they have a, a permanent record of all this stuff, not permanent, but a running record of, how much, of what happened on the network. That way, if you have a compromise, you can go back and look at the tape, so to speak. So they're big, big fans of that. Number two, probably the most unsung hero. Um, they're not very powerful, they're not very senior, but they have such a huge difference on the defensibility of your organization, it's procurement. Um, in fact, one of the first things the Rugged Software Manifesto pointed people at was, if you can't get someone to fund an application security project for the code you write, get the pro procurement people to put in the RFP, the request for proposal process, that your pro the products, you're, if you want to bid on this as our salesforce.com thing, you need to have an independent test from Veracode or someone like that. And we're going to compare that as a score relative to not just pricing and features, but also how secure you are. Do you have a published SDL? Um, do you have terms and conditions that say that there's penalties to the service contract if any of the OS top 10, 10, OS top 10 flaws manifest in the, in the life of the contract? And people would put these in there, and they would either get a better price, or they, they at least put security stuff on their supply chain. And what happened was, if in year one you can get the CIO to demand better security from the supply chain, because we deserve better, like your flaws end up being my breaches and headlines, once they get to value that, in year two you say, hey, um, we write 60% of our apps. Can we also you know, do our internal stuff? So it became an easier way to boil the frog and acclimate them. Um, people are a lot more likely to invest in something they feel entitled to, and they don't have to pay for directly, than things that are going to be a lot of work. So procurement's freaking awesome. Um, they're motivated to reduce the, the percentage of the total contract that's um, uh, maintenance and uh, get things like terms and conditions in. So if you equip them with boilerplate language to put into every contract, um, then you've won and you don't even have to manage those. Essentially, they'll always put those things in. Terms and conditions, SLAs, and, and they are a gating function where the, 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 the vendor won't get paid until, you know. The CIO, uh, they affect the bottom two layers. So they help in the choices of the IT environments and the SaaS and PaaS and IaaS environments. And they also help in the uh, operations, in the IT operations stuff. So um, they are motivated to keep things stable. They don't like change. Change is bad. Um, they want to support business intent. And they use things like governance, risk, and compliance, standards, policy, change management, change management databases, um, IT asset discovery, things like that. In fact, during our panel, if you were here for the, um, the survey panel uh, two talks ago, um, several people in the audience brought up that we do a really bad job having even an inventory of how many websites we have, or which applications we're using, or which open source components we're using. So um, one of the bigger challenges is simply knowing what you have um, for, in, in terms of your application stack. The CTO, um, depending on the organization, they do different roles and different hats, but they're primarily motivated to innovate. Um, they very much care about the intellectual property and trade secrets. It's their secret sauce. Um, and they can use coding standards. They can choose implementation languages. They can decide um, what your SDL is, is going to look like. Um, they can choose that you know, PHP is, most of our flaws end up in PHP, so we're not going to do PHP on any forward applications. You know, whatever you want to pick. In fact, when I was at Akamai, we looked at all of our findings from all of our internal and third-party code scans, and it wasn't a statement that PHP can't be written securely. It's that we had way more bug density in our PHP apps, so we just stopped making them. We said, you know what? No more, no more projects. We're going to move to a more com common code base and standard base, and we're going to stop hiring people that do that. It wasn't that you can't write it. It's just that we had a much higher statistical defect rate in those than we did in others. The CFO. They're sparingly useful, that's why I gave them a five, but they're the only one that can actually go to jail. Uh, that's the orange jumpsuit. Um, in case of SOX violations, so they don't care very often, but when they care, they care a lot. Um, so we have seen actual cases where a CFO is your best friend. Um, one of the things they are really good at is audit. And I don't mean external auditors, I mean internal auditors. So if there's any ever governance or policy kind of enforcement, they can be a really nice, useful um, ally there. I'm going to skip the VP of Sales one, but they actually are pretty useful. Um, internal audit, not very powerful, but pretty tenacious. So they're often the ones that get you prepared. I can see uh, prepared for your uh, external auditors, 
And they're really good at like checking things and double checking things. So they're not very good at defensible infrastructure or IT operations, but they're, they're pretty good at um, seeing deviations uh, in your intended policy at the countermeasure level or at the uh, instrumentation level. The, one of the real powerful ones that's emerging is the DevOps guys um, and gals. Um, they're primarily motivated by, by faster, 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 by intense velocity, by being super efficient, continuous, merciless process improvement. We can be better, we can be better, we can be better. It's kind of annoying and kind of awesome. Um, are you chuckling? Or no? Um, their primary uh, asset types is code, it's deployments, it's operational environments. So they're not just deploying an app, they're deploying entire environments at the same time often. And their tactics, techniques, and procedures are to automate, to orchestrate, to use things like Chaos Monkey, to, and, and teamwork is a huge tool. So remember my pyramid? We're going to map these guys against the pyramid all at once. So the stuff at the bottom is the really important stuff. And basically, I think the MVP here is that DevOps tends to do this. They tend to make really smart IT choices. They tend to operate them very well and have a prompt and agile response because they learn from failures quickly. And they instrument the hell out of everything. And you can start getting unbelievable granular instrumentation and telemetry data from production to notice the smallest deviations and smallest anomalies. So I think they're a total game changer as an asset and as a pattern that security needs to embrace, not run from. Um, the CIO is pretty amazing here as well. So the two that probably have the biggest impact if you're thinking about an hour of your time or a headcount or a project, it's basically procuring and operating your IT choices. The reason we don't do it is it's out, we perceive it to be outside of our control, because it is. It's not even a security thing at all. But any injection or any guidance or any projects you can promote through them have a huge asymmetric gain compared to other investments. So here's the card game. Ready? We're going to team up mashups, adversaries versus defenders. And we'll see how well it works. I'm not sure the builds are working very well here, though. So there's the auditor, the zombie auditor, and you team them up to your internal auditor. And you know what? You can make them go away pretty easily. It's pretty straightforward. We do this every single you know, year. However, add one simple script kitty using Metasploit, and you're toast. It's, this, is, this was the most damning proof that PCI is an abject failure. But this is essentially how it works. You can make the auditor go away, but you can't make the, the breach go away. And that's why we have more than, you know, we had four breaches the week of the Labor Day holiday. It's ridiculous. OK, what about battle intellectual property? OK, what we tend to do is have a nation state adversary against your internal auditor who's well poised to handle your QSA. How do you think that one works out? Right? Don't bring a knife to a gunfight. However, if you add on, and you can't necessarily see this, but if you add on general counsel, you get better instrumentation. If you pull in your risk management team, you can actually map appropriate controls on appropriate assets to the nation state adversaries. Not everywhere, but to the, to the important stuff. And if you add on procurement, you can make sure that the service providers you're using or the, the code you're buying is doing a better job to give you a better starting point for how defensible your, your IT choices are. And then you actually have a fighting chance. And when we help defense contractors or whatnot, this is essentially the, the trio that we bring to the table. Risk management team, procurement team, and, um, and general counsel. Um, chaotic actors. Anonymous showed up on the scene out of nowhere. It's the 50-day summer of lulls. And guess who they fought? Nobody. We weren't even trying. There was nobody even trying to defend the websites. DDoS is one of the easiest things to stop, and everybody went down. The irony of the summer of lulls, the 50-day summer of lulls, is that they held a mirror to our neglect. They had no skill whatsoever and were wildly successful taking down every target they tried. It was an embarrassment. But if you did something like better procurement, you use better SaaS providers, better website hosting, maybe a little DevOps, it was easy to make it go away. OK, um, so some of these case studies, which I have to do very, very quickly, um, I've kind of peppered them in so I can do them quickly. And you already have the slides, so you can see a lot of these. Um, to get more situational awareness, um, I like this. So he said, there's a difference between reacting and hunting. If you're reacting, we're done. We had to go on hunting, so he made a hunting team. You know red teams and blue teams? He also made a hunt team. And their job was they had to get budget for some certain things. So instead of buying a bunch of security products, they bought Big Fix, which is essentially a benevolent rootkit botnet. Uh, and the reason was he could ask any question of any endpoint at any time and get an answer. And he also bought um, uh, NetFlow analysis, so he could see suspicious conversations and whispers and echoes. So he just wanted to be more proactive and not be told by a business partner they had a breach. So the CIO really saw this as a productivity enabler because um, 
Big Fix also had a power management feature and a remote desktop control feature. So he sold it as a CIO IT operational excellence project. And he essentially got instant visibility into every single desktop and server he had. It was brilliant, right? He didn't pay a penny out of his budget, but he got a lot more security because he was at layers, uh, the bottom two layers of the pyramid. Does that make sense? Um, customers, I'm gonna skip that one. This is a sales example. Um, DevOps and chaotic good. Um, so this, is, uh, this was the insurance company who lied and said that there was car data everywhere. Um, he did a couple smart things. Every time they rolled out a new application, they had to go buy a, a physical WAF, and they had to um, wait for that thing to show up on the pallet, rack it, stack it, cable it, configure it, and it, it delayed the deployment of the application to production so it could remain compliant by like an extra three months minimum. So he used that to get um, a WAF as a service so they could instantly and dynamically provision. So they, they didn't call it DevOps, but it's essentially a DevOps, um, a, a fledgling DevOps program. Uh, he got his general counsel to give uh, backing and budget for instrumentation for their trade secrets, intellectual property, and sensitive organizational data. And they also said, we're not going to fund a new security program. We're going to fund a visible ops program. Because they basically bought little copies of the vis visible ops book and showed how you can be more productive, more profitable, more efficient um, by having a rigorous change management program. So he didn't have a compliance budget. He had a visible ops program, which had direct, tangible IT value and it also dampened the chaos and entropy so he could do a better job with his other security controls. Um, but one other advantage of these uh, teammates, they're not your manager of IT, they're C-levels. They're actual board level positions who are now advocates and at least feel a sense of ownership for certain parts of the project. Um, reporting structure, I love this one. Uh, a, very, a Fortune 100 company he got reorged out of the compliance team into the, the legal team. He worked for the general counsel. And the general counsel, this is how we kind of learned about the general counsel trick. He got instantaneous budget for privacy controls and data loss prevention controls and encryption controls. And we joked about it. We said, if you really want to have a comprehensive program, you should deliberately get your job changed, your reporting structure changed to different members of the uh, executive suite. And within a, a full cycle, you'll have a full program. Uh, because different ones cared about different things. It was just a fact. Uh, and you had a good anecdote, which you should tell people in the hallway. Um, there you go. I don't have time for that one. Okay, so the punchline is, what's your role in all this, right? So if there's lots of these case studies. You can read them at your leisure. I actually wrote some, some of them up when I was an analyst. Um, your role is TBD, right? But what I'm saying is we started off as a rookie. We didn't know what we were doing. And then we became a seasoned individual professional hero individual contributor. We got a lot, as much done as we could. Your new job is to be Nick Fury. You know, he used to be a hero, but now what did he do? He assembled the Avengers, right? He got all the right heroes together because for greater foes and greater enemies, you need a team. You have a team of adversaries. You don't have a team of defenders. So your role really is to assemble and to inspire and to manage and herd those cats because each one of them has certain triggers, things they care about, things they're, they're measured by. And if you use the right argument for the right asset team, and that's why we want to make that card game. It's not a fictional card game. We want to make it where you're given a certain set of assets or adversaries or attacks, and you have to determine and figure out the right way to rise to those challenges. So your reply slide is, who is your team? Who can you work with that you're not? It's on that list of adversaries. And we've already given you at least a hint. And you basically buy them a coffee, you buy them lunch, and you might even walk through that adversary map. Um, and I would encourage you to try at least to get one new swim lane, at least one new project per layer of the pyramid, uh, because my hunch is if you try one la per layer of the pyramid, you're never going to go back to buying blinky boxes again. I mean, of course you need them, but when you see how much more impact you will have, I don't care how long you've been in your, your job, if you, have, if you have a success at influencing an IT procurement choice that is more defensible, you will be so addicted to the gains that you get from that, that you'll, you're going to be hungry to keep doing that kind of thing. And the programs we've seen transform themselves after a breach, or the programs that we've seen transform themselves um, after getting job, a, a reporting structure change, it's just undeniable that you're going to be much, much more effective when you can convince somebody else's department and budget to prioritize at least one aspect of the spectrum of your risk portfolio. Uh, it's just, um, it's breathtaking, and it, it takes you from that trough of disillusionment and depression and despair to realizing, my role is to be a coach. Uh, what did you say, Damon? A coach and a toolsmith? Yeah. yeah. Your role changes from being the doer and the, the lone guy screaming in the darkness to being someone who can 
catalyze the right teammates for the right, use the right tool for the right job. And um, remember, none of these people who you fight with see themselves as a villain. One of the best pieces of advice I ever got from mentors is no one is the villain in their own story. And the corollary to that is you know, everyone can be the hero of their own story. So find some way to make them the hero. Uh, there are a ton of slide shares on the original talks that led into this, and I'll leave you with that. Again, I'm Josh Corman, and that's my Twitter handle, that's the Rugged Software handle, and that's the I am the Cavalry handle. And I think I'm a for formally out of time, but I will take questions informally or until they make me stop. Um, but you don't have to give up. Defeat and cynicism is a choice. Um, I think you can choose uh, to try to hit reset and do new things. Um, and if you want to be connected with any of those real people, they are not very vocal outwardly, but they are willing to talk to and coach uh, privately one-on-one. -on -one. So, thank you. <laughs>